tell us more, we have from Repsol, Elena Thomas and Emilio Martin, both senior data scientists at Hub Data and Analytics. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Nicolas. Um, Hi, Emilio, are you sharing I'm the screen? Start to, yeah, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So okay. let me know when you start seeing my presentation, please. Sure, I'll confirm it. Okay, still, we still can't see it. We can see it, everything's, okay. everything's all set. Take it away, Emilio. Okay, thank you. Okay, so th thank you very much for your introduction, Nicolas. Um, as you say, my name is Emilio Martin. Uh, today, together with my teammate, Elena Tomás, we are going to talk about how we are managing corrosion detection in, in our refineries. Essentially, the talk is divided in two clear parts. The first one is related um, more about what is the mission of Repsol as a company, and uh, how we are performing our digital transformation program. Uh, the second part that uh, I think is going to be more interesting, not only because I'm not going to be the speaker, but also because Elena is going to share a lot of technical details about the kind of uh, neural network architecture that we are using to, to detect corrosion in, in our refineries. Um, so when we were preparing this talk last week, um, we tried to put on our audience shoes. And the first question that um, came to our mind was why? Why a company like Repsol with, um, you know, more than 20, 5,000 employees and with almost 100 years of history is investing so actively in this kind of technology. Um, and the answer to that question is pretty simple. Essentially, we are a multi-energetic company and our mission is to bring and design the energy of the future to our customer. Um, and essentially, this is a simple statement that is a, a a really difficult puzzle that we are trying to, to solve in our day to day. So although, to be honest, I don't think that we have a definitive answer to, to that puzzle, um, we know some of the pieces. Uh, for example, one of the pieces uh, on that puzzle is um, to provide clean energy. And in this regard, uh, last December, our company made public uh, our commitment to become a net zero emission company by 250. I know that um, 250 could sound like, um, you know, 30 years time, so it's a lot of time, but um, this commitment comes from our CEO. Um, also, we have a, a set of milestones that we have to achieve. So that means that we are working in our day-to-day -day, uh, actively to, achieve that goal. Um, and I think that uh, a good example of that is um, um, about who, uh, how we are um, using um, our uh, technology and talent to, to try to figure out what is the, the answer to, to that question is the, um, the hackathon that uh, we participated last summer, and essentially the hackathon was arranged by Microsoft, and the aim of that hackathon was to detect um, to detect uh, methane leaks using satellite images, um, um, and essentially artificial intelligence in general. So the main challenge here was that, um, as is pretty common in our in industry there was a scarcity of data. So essentially the, um, the team came up with, a, I think a pretty innovative solution that instead of uh, trying to stick with, um, with a supervised learning approach, we came up uh, with a simulation approach and on top of on that simulator, we put an, an, optimi an optimizer in order to essentially uh, assess what, what is the probability for uh, for each of our assets to be responsible of causing some leaks. And I 
essentially, well, and we won the hackathon and it was an international hackathon. And I'm sharing this piece of history that maybe we could provide further details in the in the next big things. Uh, not only because uh, the outcome was uh, pretty good, but also because I think that it is simplified pretty well how we perform things in, in Repsol and how we are uh, trying to solve this big puzzle that is to design the energy of the future. Um, as I said, we don't know, we don't have yet a definitive answer, but we know some some pieces of that puzzle. Um, and essentially, some of those pieces are, for, for us, key ingredients are uh, people, talent people, um technology and resources and to share with you um sorry to share with you um some figures about uh, our digital transformation program the first thing that maybe draws your attention is the scale of our uh, digital transformation program uh, we refer to our digital transformation program as a kind of umbrella under we develop all kind of digital initiative. Uh, we have uh, underway more than 200 digital initiatives in which are involved more than 1,200 people in a cross-company collaboration with a budget set only for the previous year on, sorry, on, on 150 million of euro with an estimated return by 2022 of 1 billion and obviously we can not do that uh, we can accomplish that um, that huge amount of project by only using internal resources but so therefore we rely on some partner and supplier and the last part that uh, i think that is also quite important is the people and talent people in under this digital program, we created uh, almost 500, um, 500 new roles and employees, and we also in different well, and, and me works for the data analytics hub, but there are other hubs that are like digital blockchain on the channel, robot, robot uh, process automati automation, cloud competence center, cybersecurity, data marketing and hardware robotics. Essentially, um, in this picture, you can see our chain of value. Uh, so we have different portfolios. Um, we have exploration and production, trading, refining, distribution, electricity and gas, consumption, and corporate. Uh, the project that uh, we are going to share with you today is framing the refining, refining portfolio, and inside, its uh, portfolio, we have different strategic initiatives. Um, in the case of refining, the first initiative uh, that we have is flow lessons and always safe. That essentially is aimed, which is aimed to improve the workforce and plan safety levels with uh, tax autom automation and some real tasks data assessment. Here are also safety is I would say the our highest priority. Uh, autonomous plan that is related um, to use data in order to optimize um, the parameters of our units and also of our plants in order to improve the process uh, in a automatic uh, manner. And improve the process could be like reduce the energy consumption or produce more product of certain quality and to um, uh, business planning that uh, essentially in this kind of project we use predictive analytics to optimize our decision and our decision range from design which kind of um, component you can buy or how to um, how to char or, or discharge um, some vessel or well, this kind of stuff and uh, the, the project that we are going to share today is uh, framed the, in the strategic initiative that we call zero unexpected failures. That essentially is saying 
to increase reliability and reduce maintenance costs, and somehow extend the asset life cycle and maximize uh, the production. Uh, all this, uh, I mean, every single digital product that we develop uh, under this uh, strategic initiative uh, is inside uh, uh, one internal product that we call Asset Health. That essentially is an application in which uh, we can deploy uh, different models to asset the health of, of our assets. So focusing a little more in, in the top in the topic of this talk that is corrosion, just um, as Nicolas said at the beginning of the presentation, corrosion has a huge impact in our operation. So typically it means uh, a couple of millions per year of impact. And we have and we can distinguish two types of corrosion: uh, internal corrosion and external corrosion. In this graph, you can see. Uh, the number of interventions that we have made each year and in blue we have uh, internal corrosion and in red we have uh, external corrosion. Essentially internal corrosion represents the 80% of our interventions and external corrosion only the, the remaining 20%. Here you have a snapshot of our application that, which is called Asset Cell. Uh, right now I'm going to share a, a video Essentially, uh, the aim of the, this kind of project is not only detect uh, defect and uh, corrosion in our pipe, but also to provide a prioritized list to our technician in order to make inspection. Because as you can imagine, with thousands of kilometer pipes, uh, what you have to, what you want to have is uh, just a prioritized list uh, about about in which part of the refinery you should uh, inspect. So I'm going to put uh, a video. So th this is typically uh, an image of one of our refinery. And for those of you that have never been in a refinery, a refinery is a pretty big thing. So maybe it has several kilometers. Um, Several square kilometer. Um, regarding the application, um, essentially when one of the our technicians logging, sorry, uh, one of the technician logging, he has, uh, sorry, he has a list. Uh, he has an agenda and he has a list of next actuation. And for each pipe, uh, he has the the name of the asset the line, the parameter who is having a higher impact in the in the asset health estimation and a set of nodes. And also he has uh, a set of assets located in in the refinery and also ordered by the the asset health evaluation that the different models are providing for each asset. So if we click on a particular asset we can also see the, the evolution in the time about uh, that asset, how it's uh, evolving that uh, health index and, and so on. So now I will pass you over to my colleague, Helena, who is going to provide more details about uh, the models and the challenge that we face uh, doing this uh, external corrosion project. Elena, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, can you hear me? I was talking. We yes, Elena, we can yes. hear you. Okay, nice. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, why did we choose external corrosion for our presentation? Uh, okay, we think that it's a, a more complex problem. We have developed our own external corrosion tool. Uh, while in the market, there were already commercial available solutions for internal corrosion. So this thing, uh, we consider it more innovative. 
why is this a challenge? Uh, the challenge is to look for correlations between the visual and the therm thermal images uh, and try to find insulation breakdowns of our pipes. Uh, the, uh, the reason it is challenging is that we want to do that in a non-invasive way. We don't want to, to, to do it, to check the, 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 the defect uh, manually every time we have, because to check the defect manually means that we have to remove the insulation and we would like to remove the insulation only if the operator is quite sure that there is a that 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 there is a corrosion problem underneath so this is what what we aim to and the way we have uh, started to deal with is to build a machine learning model to automatically detect these defects by using visual and thermal images here in these images you can see four different kinds of defect uh, the image on the left shows some small defects of ruptures. Uh, the, the, the following image shows some uh, complete detachment of steel on a pipe. The third image shows when this detachment of the steel is, is only partial. And the fourth image uh, shows another kind of defects that are very popular, which uh, are defects that occur within the, the joint uh, of the pipes. So this is our objective and the difficulties we find are different and several. Here in the image, you can see some part of the rack of the refinery in La Coruña uh, that we have used to start with this pro project, which is the starting of, uh, it, it's a successful, it will be the, followed by, the, by another phases of the project. But for this part of the project, we are limited to this data from one rack in, ref in this refinery. Uh, another difficulty is that the ground truth uh, is very difficult to know. Uh, it's not only needed uh, that the operators would check the ground truth in the images. The operator has to go to the real site and check if the defect is a real defect or no. So it's not a ground truth uh, very easily to detect even for a human. And it is combined with, with the fact that the corrosion defects are sometimes located in, in parts of the rack that are most, more difficult to be reached. So it's difficult to go there and check. And then uh, if we detect accurately X, Y, and Z coordinates, which is another challenge, detect three dimensional coordinates from a two dimensional image, then uh, our work will, will be more useful to the operator in, in order to make its impact. So these are the kind of images that we are going to use. I already showed the visual and these are the thermal images. Uh, we see that the available data is the scarce, as I previously mentioned. Uh, for this part of the project, we have uh, less than 1,000 images, uh, if we include both thermal images and visual models. And we have built two models, the thermal model, which will distinguish between two classes, defect or non-defect, and the visual model, which will distinguish between the four kinds of defects. The thermal model is not uh, always um, useful because there are some defects not, uh, that maybe not switch off or on, depending on the weather conditions and on the operating conditions. If the pipe are not wet, you may have a defect, but you may, may be not detecting this defect in the thermal model. So this is the reason behind combining both. Okay, just uh, for those of you mm, who don't have it very fresh, uh, this is a summary of the of the analytical challenge of co of the field of computer vision in the in the latest year in the previous years, which uh, almost has to do with the feature extraction part. Uh, in the past, it was a very hard. Uh, tasks to, to be made, but in the more recent years, in the last 15 to, 20, to 10 years, uh, in the field of deep learning, a lot of progress that has uh, improved the computer vision challenges because now they can uh, build features in an automatically way. The, um, the reason behind this, you can see in the upper right left of the slide, you can see this is a convolution operation uh, we could uh, see like if our images would be represented by a matrix, uh, 
made up of numbers. And what is a convolution is a, a mathematical operation which will um, get another matrix and uh, put this matrix across the original image and will produce another matrix or another image. The purpose uh, in the image on the upper on the bottom left, we can see what would be the uh, what is the archi the normal architecture of the deep learning used for computer vision tasks. Normally, it's based on these kinds of com convolutional layers, and the the way that each layer operates is the one that you can be see described on the image. The first layers will uh, get uh, features of the image that are uh, low low level. For example, we could detect the borders. We could detect difference in the lights. Uh, as we go and move forwards to the right in the layers, we could be appreciating more complex features. Uh, for example, we could extract circles, geometric uh, like um, rectangles, and then a more even more complex things. So that the objective here is to generalize the image that we have on the left which is a car, into something that would say this is something large with four wheels, so that we could apply it in, our, in the last layer of our uh, architecture for classification tasks. This has been uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, has been everywhere in the scientific community. community. There are several problems that you can approach and solve using these tools. In our case, we are going to uh, use object detection because we want to detect the defects and image classification. Once we have the, the, the defects detected, we have to classify into one, two, three, or the fourth label. As I've said in the last uh, 10 years, starting from 2012 especially, we can see in the upper part of the slide that the top one accuracy has increased greatly from 50% to almost 90%. Here you can see several architectures, famous architectures in the field like AlexNet, Inception. Uh, the thing and the way these uh, architectures has improved the results mainly deal with the number of parameters that we are including in the model, we can see that the radius of every circle has to do with this million of parameters and that uh, it's, um, it's uh, very huge. We observe almost the end in 2019, the effort of the scientific community by much change in the, in the accuracy, which is called the efficient nets that we have used in in this, uh, in our model. But how can we make use of all these uh, state-of-the-art studies of the scientific community? The answer is transfer learning. Transfer learning is a change of paradigm uh, apart from traditional machine learning. In the past, we used one data set to learn one task and another different data set to learn another task. With ma transfer learning paradigm, we are able to make, take advantage on one data set that has been trained for learning task one and combine this learning with our smaller data set two in order to make our system learn task two. So with less images, you get uh, and less computing time and less uh, computing expenses, you, le you get a good performance on task two. In order to see this more in detail, we can see here how, how could we transfer, transfer these parameters um, in a more technical way. In the upper part of the slide, we can see how uh, we train the system one in order to complete the task one, which is how to classify between elephant, wall, snake, and terrier labels. We can see the architecture, which is made up normally of several convolutional layers and at the end of it, some fully connected layers, and we make pass the training images through it. This is what we call the pre-trained model. Now we were interested in transferring some of the parameters of this network that it has been costly to, to, to get. And the, tra the transfer parameters that we normally freeze are the parameters that are encoded in the, in the part of the first layers, well, or the, not the last layers of the architecture, which has to do normally with embeddings and with uh, feature 
extractions. So in this way, now we are going to pass through our training images so that, for example, for training what we say a window, we could uh, make take advantage of the thing that architecture one has uh, already learned in previous tags. For example, learn how to identify rectangles. So this is the idea, the main idea behind, behind this paradigm. In Repsol, we are uh, using it uh, in many projects, uh, many projects having to do with computer vision and many other projects that has to do with natural language processing. The reason beneath it is that uh, in that way, uh, we will save uh, computing time, we will save uh, expenditures, and we also will reduce our carbon footprint that, as my colleague Emilio mentioned at the beginning, it's one of our purposes for 2015 at zero emissions commitment. So apart from that, uh, the other advantage of transfer learning, and as I've already mentioned, is that in many domains, not only in this case of, a, of this project, training data is scarce. At the end, all our companies under the digitalization program, but uh, to, to make it a real data-driven company with the size that it is, we have to, to start little by little and not, uh, we, can, we don't have always the, all the available data that we, we, that we would wish. So, uh, yes, here, uh, uh, why did I introduce the problem on transfer learning? Because this is the base. The base are for our visual and thermal models are pre-trained models from using the architecture of efficient net and rest net for the thermal, which has been trained on the COCO data set. And for the framework, we have used the Tensor to Flow Object Detection API because of its uh, performance and popularity. And afterwards, uh, we get our own model, which is able to receive these kind of images and uh, render output the coordinates X, Y, Z of the defect, the class of the defect, and the confidence score of the defect. What's the performance of our model? Okay, so what metric did we choose to measure our performance? Since our data set is, um, is unbalanced, we cannot choose the accuracy and we have to go to metrics such as precision or recall. I will remind you briefly what precision means. Precision is the true positives out of the positives that I say they are, and recall is the positives that I say out of the real positives that we can find in the sample. For our business unit, the important metric here, most important is recall, because they don't want to miss defects in their refineries. Uh, if you see and take a look to the results on the thermal images, we can see that the precision and recall are quite high. We uh, have a precision of 95% and recall of 70%. However, for the business unit, this is not enough because, of, as I mentioned previously, not always are the thermal defects on, switch on. So we have to have a model that uh, also performs good on the visual images. Here, our performance is lower. However, we are trying to improve it by retraining the model with more training data. But this machine learning model that I have presented is only a small part within our whole pipeline. I want to emphasize here all the pipeline that we have developed in this project. The first part in green is the manual process, which has to do with uh, modeling three dimension in the space that we are studying. And the second part, which is automatically, which includes the machine learning model and the linking between the 2D images and the 3D uh, geo reference of the defects and the web that we have built. In order for the to do the manual model, a photogrammetry must be done. And the photogrammetry, to summarize, is to uh, convert the space that we are studying into a three-dimensional model. How do we do this? So here on the right, we have an example. In order to get a 3D example, a 3D object of this house, I would have to take 
360 degrees images at three different heights, low, medium, and high. And then on the sketch on the left, you can see how if I have these kind of images with this kind of um, perspectives, I could uh, geometrically find the edges of the three-dimensional object. This is the first step we did at the beginning of the project. Uh, the second step was, but the first step, the photogrammetry, it's give, it, give, it renders you a three-dimensional model, but it's a relative model. We don't have it with a really absolute coordinates. For that, we have uh, developed an object model based on a laser scanning of the same area and based on the label assets that the business unit uh, provided us. In this way, we are modeling this three dimensionally and we are going to be able to connect these things with the photogrammetry. So the objective here that we have uh, read is to convert the to the, image, to the images into 3D points. And so once that I have detect, a detection in one 2D image, I can relate it with this X, Y, and Z coordinate and the name of the asset, which is great. This is the thing that really helps the business unit. And what's more here, which is very advanced apart from this, is the fact that we have built these visual and thermal cubes, three-dimensional cubes, so that we are able to group the defects. For example, we may have one defect that uh, is being corresponded by 10 images taken for diff uh, from different perspectives. So when we present these images to the, to the um, operator, maybe in this image you can see the defect from one or two and not from, the, uh, from eight of the 10 images, from the 10 of from the 10 images. Then, this is the last part of the project, which has to do with the model um, validation, retaining, and prioritization of areas. Here on the bottom right, we can see what the operator would see in the website. You can see that the blue dots are the defects that we find. So the operator can click on any of these defects and prioritize and see the pictures that the model is choosing that, cor that is corresponding to, the, to a defect or another. In this way, the operator can choose the area of the refinery where he, ha where he has to move in order to assess that the defect is or is not true. Or maybe he can see that there are four defects in the same uh, area, so he can decide, he or she can decide to uh, remove the insulation, which is a hard part. So this is one part of the web. The other is that we are giving here an, an um, a tool for the analyst so that in case that he can relabel the image as true or false defect so that it will help us with the model validation and retainer in the future. And here are the key improvements that we have found out during the length of the project. There are mainly three, one related to image acquisition. In this case, it is very important to uh, take very good pictures. I mean, good, I mean, uh, neat, no very, no difference in, in sunny or clarity, not shadows, these kind of things that uh, will help a lot a machine learning computer vision algorithm. Then these thermal images and visual must overlap in these 360 degrees when we do it. And then another choice that we uh, took when we started was to use radiation image instead of temperature image because temperature image depends a lot on the kind of uh, day and it's difficult to be repeated in the same temperature images for the same asset. Then the second was labeling improvements. We found several difficulties in the first weeks of the project. Uh, only one person was devoted to label the thermal image. Another, another one was devoted to label the visual images so that the labelings were always done in the same way. We had to remove one class in visual model because we didn't have many examples of that. And we have to relabel re some defects. Um, and in the, um, in the field of data augmentation, what we did was to take different parts of the picture, zooming in, zooming out, and rotate it. 
to assess for the image vari variability. And the most important thing is the retraining. During the length of the project, uh, of this part of the project, we have lasted for three months. We have uh, retrained twice uh, during these three months, and now we are retraining another. And we have uh, tried to build capabilities in our website so that in the future this retraining which will, be, uh, will be much more easy and, and that the available labeled data will increase. So uh, I think with this we finish our presentation. I would like to thank you for the opportunity you gave us to present our work and I hope you enjoyed our our, our presentation and, and we are pleased to, to answer any questions that you may have. Thank Emilio, you. Elena, thank you so much for, for that yeah. very interesting presentation. So we do have some questions for you. Uh, let's dive straight in. Ruben asks, why defect, no defect, only one class? In the thermal limit, there is one class in the, because there was only all the defects were switching on. Uh, there is no difference. You only see if, if something is being more wet or not. You cannot okay. assess the, the kind of defect. Good. If there is corrosion, you will see that the insulation properties of the pipe is different. So, or is different or not? Sure. Uh, another question, Guglielmo. Because of the extremely limited availability of data, did you try some one-shot or few-shot learning algorithms? Not yet. Not yet, because in this part of the project, uh, el, Sadly, we devoted less time for them to the machine learning model than for all the thing that goes uh, around the ones of uh, the, the most uh, difficult part here was have a reliable way of linking the effect to the positioning, to the geo positioning. So we devoted more time on that and for the one shot we didn't try. We only tried the normal transfer learning with the images that are available and um, and limit some intention. Okay. Question it from Kenneth. Right, uh, Did you use the pre-trained network for the classification or used it for feature extraction? If you used it for extraction, which classifier did you finally use for your classification? And a follow-up. Does your model include both classification and continuous regression to arrive at its output? I don't know if I understood the whole complete question, but I will try to answer. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, we use the feature extraction layers, not the classification layers. The classification layers were our own layers, and it was a classification layer, not regression layer. All right. Well, hopefully that uh, answers your question, Kenneth. If not, you'll have to get in touch. Um, yeah. Niall, yeah. How, does the, how does the model pick up CUI? CUI is the part of internal oh. corrosion, isn't it? This was wow. a statistical model based on the flow properties. Okay, I can't help you, you with that. If you want to have more details, uh, we can yes, write yeah. us. Okay. Yeah, it was he, he tried to contact uh, through the, Twitter, yeah. so we, we, yeah, we, we yeah. can follow up that question. In, on Twitter sure, or, that would be the yeah. best way for some of these questions are very specific. Is there any yeah. process to detect the quality of the images previous the machine learning model? Question from Alejandro. The, pro the, the process to detect the quality of the images has uh, been carried out manually. Uh, we don't have an automatic way of saying this is not valid, this is valid because all our images go, go through the training part. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, at the beginning the steps, we saw that our performance of the was not good, and we um, take a step backwards and say, "Okay, the images are not being okay." But we don't have an automatically way of removing that uh, all the image. So all the images at the moment are manually taken. There's no automation of the image capture. No. Yes. Now there's uh, automation, but he means. Uh, I think the question means for the for the quality, all the images are taken. Okay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter any quality, yeah. 
Can we uh, come we back have perhaps? A, we have tried to we have tried to teach how to yes well the things that I have mentioned to tell the business units, but in the case that in some part they do things badly, we are not testing that automatically if the quality is not. Right. Uh, a final question: What about the from the human resources point of view? The technicians that previously you would have required to walk these kilometers, thousands of kilometers, and inspect all these pipes manually, are they being retrained or are they being replaced? What are some of the HR consequences of what we're doing here? Well, I, I think that then, I mean, the technology is just a, a tool, and, and essentially, um, they, they are not going to be replaced, of course. The, the thing is that the, we are just providing a tool to prioritize the work because most of the time when you talk with the technician, they what, what they say with you is that uh, essentially they don't know where to spend. I mean, they, they have so many possibilities and so many kilometers to spend that um, just bringing them a tool to that give, a, that give they a prioritization is... Uh, they, I mean, they are pretty happy with that too. So it's not, um, we are not trying to replace our technician because, well, you know, it takes a lot of time to, to create a, a good technician. Great. Well, that's, that's great. And for anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. listen, it just remains for me to thank you both very much indeed. We're almost out of time. So maybe some of these more specific questions will find a way through the networking section to address them directly to you. And uh, once again, thanks very much indeed to both of you. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much.